Hello, and welcome to part four of our lecture series on the urinary system. And in part four, we're going to take a look at the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Now, the juxtaglomerular apparatus, juxta for near, glomerula, glomerulus, uh, glomerulus, just basically uh, a structure that's going to be close to uh, the glomerulus uh, within the capillaries. And so we're going to be looking at a structure that's located near the vascular pole of the renal corpuscle. And if we take a look at the structures associated with it, it's going to have components that are a portion of the distal convoluted tubule, as well as a portion that's associated with the afferent arterial. And so if we take a look at the cells that are primarily associated with the juxtaglomerular apparatus, we're going to see these extraglomerular mesangial cells. Uh, these are cells that are labeled as essentially 5B. They're going to help hold the thing together as well as uh, juxtaglomerular cells, which are going to be uh, six. Uh, that we're going to take a look at, as well as cells at seven, those reddish cells, which are going to be found within the wall of the distal convoluted tubule itself. And so if we take a look at this, the macula densa, uh, these cells uh, at seven, um, they're the kind of reddish cells, uh, we're going to take a look at them. It's going to be tightly packed columnar cells of the distal uh, tubule. They're going to be relatively close to the vascular pole of the renal corpuscle. And macula densa, basically, because we're going to look at a dense or packed accumulation of the nuclei within this region. And these are cells that are going to be capable of essentially monitoring the osmolarity of the fluid within the tubule lumen. And so we're going to basically look at the concentration of the materials that are flowing through the distal tubule in this location. The mesangial cells, uh, as we said, are going to be uh, specialized cells which are going to hold the juxtaglomerular apparatus together. Uh, but the important cells uh, that we're going to take a look at are going to be the juxtaglomerular cells. Now the juxtaglomerular cells are going to be modified smooth muscle cells in the wall of the apparent arterial. And so we're going to take a look at this, and they're going to be modified in such a way that they're going to look more like something that uh, secretes uh, materials rather than just simply a smooth muscle cell. You take a look at these, especially in electron microscopy, these modified smooth muscle cells, these juxtaglomerular cells, are going to have numerous cytoplasmic granules. Uh, the cytoplasmic granules would stain with a periodic acid shift, the PAS uh, reaction that we've seen previously. And basically what's going to be found within this is going to be the enzyme renin. And basically what these cells do, these modified smooth muscle cells, is that they take a look at uh, normal blood volume and look at blood pressure and respond a little bit uh, to the levels of blood sodium. But all of these things are going to be related to uh, blood pressure. And if we have below normal blood volume or below normal uh, blood sodium, and again, sodium is going to be related to that. If we got a higher level of sodium, we're going to draw more fluid into the bloodstream. If we have lower levels of sodium, uh, blood may, the fluids of the blood may go out into the tissues of the body, but overall it would have an effect on m causing a low blood pressure to be present. So in essence, in the uh, presence of low blood pressure, these juxtaglomerular cells are going to secrete the enzyme renin. Renin itself can be enhanced by blood born catecholamines. We'll talk about some of these catecholamines later on within our endocrine system lecture uh, coming up next. Um, so it can be enhanced by catecholamines. It can be diminished by atrial natriuretic hormone, uh, which essentially causes natriuresis and diuresis, which is essentially uh, kind of getting rid of sodium, getting rid of water within the body. And so it has an opposite effect of things like aldosterone and ADH, antidiuretic hormone. And so essentially these things, again, uh, the catecholamines, the atrial natriuretic uh, hormone, can essentially regulate the uh, concentration of ions and the concentration of fluids that are going to be found within the bloodstream. Now if we focus in on the actions of renin, renin essentially cleaves the, the plasma uh, protein angiotensinogen, producing angiotensin 1. Uh, angiotensinogen, as we talked about previously, was produced in the liver. Uh, renin cleaves it into angiotensin 1, uh, an enzyme, lung converting enzyme, uh, essentially an enzyme for the lung, converts it into angiotensin 2. And so we took uh, an inactive molecule, 
primed it, and then we produced angiotensin II, which is going to be an active uh, molecule. We take a look at this, angiotensin II is going to be a vasoconstrictor. And so again, think about what started this whole thing. Below normal blood volume, below normal blood pressure, triggered the release of rennet. And now through this process, we've activated angiotensin II, which is a vasoconstrictor. We're going to cause blood vessels to constrict down, which is going to have an overall effect of increasing blood pressure. Angiotensin II is also going to stimulate aldosterone. We'll talk about aldosterone production uh, in the adrenal cortex in the next big series of lectures we've got. But it's essentially a steroid hormone, which is going to increase sodium and chloride reabsorption within the distal tubules. So again, keep in mind that as the raw filtrate is passing through our uriniferous tubules, through our proximal tubules, through our distal tubules, we're going to be modifying the materials, regulating what's reclaimed by the body, in essence recycled, and what's eliminated from the body as waste. If we bring in more sodium and more chloride, more reabsorption means we're going to get rid of less of it within the urine, but that sodium and chloride is going to get into the body, it's going to get into the fluids of the body, it's going to get into the blood stream of the body, and sodium and chloride is essentially going to draw in more water. And so if we've got a higher concentration of salts within our blood, we're going to have a higher concentration of water within our blood, draw more water in, and that's going to pump up the volume. If we pump up the volume of blood, we're going to have the overall effect of increasing blood pressure. Another actions of, of renin is the sodium and chloride, as we said, are going to be drawn into the body by those distal tubules and it's going to get into those paratubular capillaries. And by getting into the paratubular capillaries, it's going to draw water into the capillaries and increase blood volume and increase blood pressure, as I said on the previous slide. We take a look at this as increased blood pressure that's going through the body. It is going to stretch our afferent arterioles. It's going to stretch our juxtaglomerular cells. And because we've increased the blood pressure, it's going to either decrease or stop our renin secretion. So again, we take a look at how this was started in the beginning. Decreased blood pressure caused these glomerular cells to release renin. Renin went through, activated, in essence, angiotensin II. We're going to increase blood volume, increase blood pressure, cause a stretching of these glomerular cells, and turn down or turn off their renin secretion. So we've got a good negative feedback system for regulating uh, both the renin secretion and regulating our blood volume, blood pressure. Okay, and that's going to finish up our discussion of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Um, come back for, uh, I think, lecture five within this series. We're going to take a look at modifying uh, that filtrate, that urine, into either a concentrated or a dilute urine, which can be voided from the body. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thank you.